So there we go. Welcome all to our first lecture of the semester, um, which we have not one, but two distinguished lecturers this, this time around, which we have had in the past more than one. We actually had Rios architects here uh, at the end of last semester, and there were three of them. Um, and it's great to have some diversity uh, of positions and um, information that can be given to you guys. And that's what we're striving to do with this. Um, I do want to point out, and I will change my share in a second. I'm going to pull it up. Uh, that many of our previous lectures are available on YouTube. And I am going to get to where those are. Matter of fact, I will show this too. I'm going to stop share and share my computer. And then you see everything. But when I went to YouTube, it defaulted to place I've last been. But the AIA LA chapter is uh, opening up its own office, which is the first, first time they've had a freestanding building of their own. And that is opening soon. So we, you know, be on the lookout for that because uh, there's a big opening reception. Um, there's actually a exhibit of student work from all the Southern California schools of which El Camino is included in that. It's called a two by eight, um, I think, uh, series. But all you guys out there, you will get information from me very soon because that is coming. The office is located in the um, Adams District, which is straight up Crenshaw from where our school is, just south of um, the 10 freeway. So look for that because you'll get an opportunity to see both the new office as well as... Um, see the exhibit of all the different <laughs> Southern Cal schools. So look for that. Also, as I was saying on YouTube, if you Google search ECC Art Club, you will see many of the lectures that we've had previously that have been recorded and archived that you can go there and see. And I have a few others, including last semesters, that I will be uploading very soon. So look for those. Um, some really great uh, lectures, including a four-part uh, tutorial on how to use SketchUp. That was done in one of my prior classes. That tutorial is a four, three-hour session tutorial that's there for everybody's use if you want to learn uh, SketchUp on your own. Look for that. So look for that amongst the other six or seven lectures that are available, including uh, this was RTKL. That woman looks a little familiar. It's Peggy Johnson's sister that was once a uh, principal there. So look for those things. And... Lastly, upcoming uh, next month, our next lecture will be Wednesday, the 18th of October, and a gentleman from RDC will be given a lecture on their firm in practice, which is down in Long Beach, and we're going to follow that by a tour of their office for a date to be determined late October, early November. So look for all of those things and a lot more coming from the club, okay? So without further ado, we want to jump in and give her as much room and time as she needs. Um, and we'll follow up the lecture with a brief Q&A. So whatever questions you have, 
you should drop them in the chat for me as well as just hold on to them, you know, and I will read, read them off and let uh, Christina and her colleague Daniel answer, answer things. So without further ado, I am going to let Christina Delgado of HGA Architects take over and tell you a little of her story and about her practice and journey in architecture. I mean, architecture. Go from there. And I'm sorry, Daniel as well. Daniel Spillman is there too. Great. Um, Dan, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Sure, absolutely. Um, my name is Daniel Spillman. I am a project architect with HGA, and I work uh, I work alongside of Christina um, on a day to day basis. Uh, my focus at HGA is on what we call our ACE group, which is our arts, community, and education, is what the A and the C and the E stand for. Um, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into kind of where each of us come from and and where, what our story is uh, down the road, but um, just wanted to briefly introduce myself. Thanks, Dan. And as uh, Ruben said, thank you for the intro. I'm Christina Delgado, and I'm a project manager at HGA. I've been in the game for about 15 years and uh, started as an intern, moving up um, through a project architect, and ultimately uh, am at project manager currently. Uh, I wear, you know, both Dan and I wear um, different hats in our office and firm as well. Uh, but one of the other hats that I wear at HGA is I'm a very big advocate uh, for equity issues in our firm um, and in our industry. And so I was, I'm the outgoing co-chair of our national equity advisory group at HGA, uh, which has representatives from, from all over the firm. And that's been a huge strategic initiative and passion project for our CEO. And I'm just very excited uh, to be part of that. So one thing I'll do here just face to face is give you um, an intro about HGA, Hamill Green and Abramson, uh, which is the firm that uh, Dan and I have been at actually for the past five years. We both started in 2018 at this firm um, and both really happy to be here. It is a national practice. So it ha we have about uh, 12 offices nationwide, our oldest and largest offices being in Minneapolis and Milwaukee. Uh, so the, the firm was founded in the Midwest, uh, but we have uh, several, I believe about five offices here in California on the West Coast and in, in Southern California, our LA office is in Santa Monica and our, we have a new San Diego office. And then on the East Coast, we have locations in Boston and Washington, D.C. Uh, and growing. So it, it's, it's a wonderful practice. The range of work that we have, it spans from... Um, about four different sectors. So Dan mentioned that he and I both work in our ACE practice, arts, community, and education. Uh, all of my background is in, is in educational projects, so this was a really good fit for me. Uh, but we also, our firm also does healthcare. We do what we call public corporate, which is a lot of workplace design and public projects. Uh, we also have science and technology as a new newer sector to our practice, which has a lot of overlap with higher education projects, as you can imagine. We also are an integrated practice. So we're not, we're an architecture and engineering firm. We're not just um, uh, uh, architects on our own. We have uh, all sorts of engineers throughout the firm and we work uh, cross office um, on, on projects, multiple projects all the time. So that's been a really um, impactful thing in our careers to have because you get exposed to more sides of the practice than you, than you would at a, at a firm that only, only has engineering. It is a big A, little, little E firm though. I will say here uh, in the privacy of our soon to be posted to YouTube discussion. Just don't tell my engineers. All right, so that being said, I'm gonna share my screen and then Dan and I are gonna kind of flip back and forth uh, between talking because who wants to hear one person talk the whole time? And we also are, you're, you're welcome to talk as well. Like we're going to be talking, but this is a conversation. So if there's something that one of us mentions that kind of 
piques your curiosity or your interest or something that you, you know, are want to hear more about, please feel free to chime in, raise your hand, jump into the conversation. This is in no means like a formal presentation that you should feel bad about interrupting. Yeah. Um, I'm a parent of two small children, so I get interrupted constantly. Go for it. It's great. All right. Am I sharing? Can you see the PowerPoint screen good? Yes. All right. Yes. Yes, we Thank can. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So Ruben asked us to come here and talk about our journeys, which is when I realized that we didn't even plug the firm. So thank you for, <laughs> for sitting through that. Um, and, you know, we really wanted this. Uh, the way we can tell our stories is, is through telling them. And so we, we organized the presentation in sort of this uh, five question format. Um, and that's how we'll, we'll guide you through our journey today. Um, and we'll just dive right in. Here we go. Okay. So, you know, I, I really wanted to give you all a sense of who I am um, because that I bring my full self to work every day. I bring my full self to architecture every day. Um, and so for me, a core part of my identity is my cultural roots. I identify as Latina. Uh, my mother is from Puerto Rico, born and raised, and my father was born in Peru, but he grew up here in uh, Pico Rivera. And, you know, growing up, my cultural identity was very much based in food, music, and language. Um, and it really wasn't until I got to college and started connecting with other um, Latinx student groups and other diverse organizations. Um, and that and finally listening in my history classes uh, that I realized that my understanding of my own culture was very Spain centric. And I felt that I had almost been denied exposure to my African roots and my indigenous roots. And that was very eye opening for me at that time and really made me reevaluate my own identity and what was perceived as important about um, my culture. And so that has, uh, you know, I've continued to take that into how I practice um, and it's molded it, me into someone that asks more questions and not just take things at face value, um, maybe question ideas that I've had for my whole life or, or a long time, um, but then also endeavor to create safe spaces for others to do so, uh, which, which is what I uh, take to the office every day. Another core part of my identity here on the right and it's a new one, is parenthood. So I've been a parent for about four and a half years now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's been interesting because it's forced me, um, it's forced me to kind of reconsider a few things. So one, I've been designing educational spaces for the 15 years of my career, uh, but now having made people that are going to be inhabiting these spaces, it really uh, brings things into sharper focus and how critical the work that we do as designers is to the future generations that are gonna be in these buildings. So that really hit, the work really hits home for me every day. Uh, it's also really made me consider what work-life balance means and understanding that in the practice of architecture and in the study of architecture, that hasn't always been a priority. And um, as a parent, but then also with the pandemic, there has been a sh there has to be a shift in the industry to respect that there there can be a separation, even though you can still be passionate and excited and want to put in your whole self into your work. And I work to impart those lessons to my teams as well. I'm not going to ask somebody to do something I'm not willing to do. And for my where, um, you know, the piece of my cultural. Um, the pieces of my cultural identity, so being identifying as Puerto Rican and Peruvian, uh, what they do is they help me quickly answer the question, where are you from, when I do choose to answer it. Uh, but ironically, I've never lived in either country, but I've lived everywhere else. Uh, I was born in Arizona. I grew up in Southeast Asia. And then I went to four different high schools, three in Southern California, um, finished up in Maryland, and ended up at Virginia Tech for design school, um, lived in DC, and then I'm here in Redondo Beach um, down the street from you all. And every pin on this map is a place I've lived in for at least six months. So very, very nomadic uh, life here. 
Um, but I, you know, I learned a few core things, you know, one, you can live all over the world and still stay connected to the people you love. And that has just gotten easier and easier with technology and zoom, um, and cell phones, you know, that, uh, you don't have to be tied down um, to any place. And I also learned that I could make a home anywhere. I could make a life anywhere. And so the idea of home for me isn't really about geography. It's about who I am and who I love. And uh, that that has really shaped me. So how I made it to architecture, I, um, I mentioned, you know, I, I went to Virginia Tech, go Hokies. I know no one on the West Coast really knows what a Hokie is, but it is a fantastic design school. I was also involved in my NOMAS chapter back in the day. So I uh, have a soft spot for this organization. Um, but, you know, I kind of stumbled into architecture when I was in high school. Nobody in my family is an architect. Um, I liked music. I liked math. So I was like, hey, why not? Architecture is creative and technical. This is, I could do this. Uh, and then um, I was surprised to find when I did, when I started in architecture school, I was surprised to find that it was a lot more design focused than technically focused. Uh, to give you an example, my first day of college, I carved a bar of soap with a sheetrock nail. That was my first project. So no computer, no CAD, no drawing. It was this. And uh, my parents really wondered what they were paying for, but I think they got their money's worth. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I put a few images on here, you know, it was fun to take a deep dive into Facebook of 15 years ago, um, but the program was very hands-on. So one of the things I loved about the de design school was the making. Um, I loved discovering new materials, making mistakes, building models, and really making a mess. And the program I was in really, really encouraged that. So it was, it was super hands-on and fun. Um, and I really uh, found my love of problem solving uh, it, school and studying this work just gives you new eyes. You, you see the world in a different way. You cannot shut it off. Just ask my husband. Um, and you, you make connections that others can't. Uh, the other uh, thing that I had the opportunity to do and will recommend to anyone in um, higher education or in, in any, honestly, in any, any program, let alone architecture, is um, studying abroad. This is the, the, you know, one time in, in my life that travel was easy. Um, you get to study all over the world program and there are grants and scholarships available for, for everything. Um, and just the perspective and the people you meet and how that not only impacted who I was as a person, um, but impacted how I see the world and how I work. It are still lessons that I use uh, to this day in my practice. So I, took really full advantage. And I did three study abroad programs, um, including uh, a few weeks studying in Cuba in 2005. Um, and then I actually was uh, an exchange student in Switzerland for a full year for two semesters. And, you know, whole shebang, learned Italian, studied architecture, you know, ate really amazing food. Um, and I wish I could go back. <laughs> so that's just, it's the world. The world is your oyster at this point. All right, this is my cue. So I mentioned it earlier, but again, my name is Daniel uh, and I'm a licensed architect here in California. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about just who I am and how I got to where I am today. So um, one of the things that I wanted to share about uh, myself is that there's, you know, I, I really love being outdoors as these photos show. Um, and I try to take that influence into the work that I do every day. And as I was putting this slide together, I thought, wow, these are all like photos of me. But then I remembered, hey, in each one of these, there was a friend that was there with me that took that photo. And I realized that that's something that re really also defines um, how I like to do life and that I like to do it with the people that are, you know, that are there with me. Life is a lot better, um, both in architecture school, outside of architecture school, inside of work, outside of work, um, with the people that you care about. And so along with being outdoors, doing incredible projects with incredible people is really what inspires me. Um, you can slip to the next one. Um, so when, you, when I'm not designing buildings and working on projects, you can you know, find me in the mountains or at the beach. That's kind of my two favorite hobbies there. 
but my uh, um, my geography map here is a little bit more zoomed in than Christina's was, but um, I <laughs> did grow up on the East Coast, similarly to Christina. We didn't meet each other until we both worked at HGA together, and we came to find out that we actually lived in the same town on the East Coast, uh, just a few miles away from each other um, as we were growing up. So we're both about the same age and grew up in the same area, but didn't know each other until we moved all the way across the country uh, to work at HGA together. Uh, so uh, you can actually go to the next slide if you don't mind. So my journey started in Baltimore. I was born in Baltimore um, and I am a, an adopted uh, kid of Four. So I actually have a really diverse family. I've got a white older brother. I've got a Korean younger sister and a black younger sister. And then I am some kind of mutt. I actually don't know my uh, ethnicity or my uh, background, but I'm, you know, embrace that for what it is. And I love just the kind of multicolored family that I, that I grew up in the state of Maryland. My interest uh, in becoming an architect uh, started when I was like a kid. You know, it sounds a little bit cliche, but I, I built a tree house in my backyard and I thought, you know, this is kind of cool. I, I really enjoy building things, pulling scraps of wood together and putting them into place and nailing them to a tree. And so when I was 15 and I said, hey, mom, dad, I want to get a car. Uh, I, I really want to, you know, get something to drive. They said, well, you know, that's nice, but you got to pay for it. So I went and found a job and my first job was uh, as a carpenter's apprentice. And so I uh, spent my time while I was in high school and in college during the summers framing houses and framing buildings as a carpenter. And that really inspired my interest in making things, building things, working with my hands. And so the transition to be, um, going to architecture school was actually a, a fairly straightforward decision for me because it seemed to really align with what I knew how to do as a kid and what I knew how to do as a teenager. And, uh, but the actual real world of architecture school, as, as you all kind of know, is um, it's quite shocking. And so no longer was I, you know, kind of just hammering things and building them out of wood, but I was kind of being asked to think critically about the decisions that I'm making and being asked to uh, kind of bring inspiration and bring some type of meaning into the work that I was producing. So um, I also wanted to share that, like, I'm, uh, I'm a product of a community college as well. So just like uh, El Camino colleges, I went to uh, a uh, community college back on the East Coast called Howard Community College that then set me up the transition to a uh, four-year university at University of Maryland, where I went to the uh, University of Maryland School of Architecture. And so the photos there on the right are just a few images from my time there. Um, the, I had the opportunity to participate in the solar decathlon project, which is a national competition where you get to actually design and build a project uh, that then gets um, entered into a competition as a full scale real house. Uh, and you compete against other architecture schools across the country. So I, um, it was probably one of my best memories from architecture school. And it was kind of this really beautiful moment for me where I was able to bring that background that I had as a kid, putting things together and building things as a teenager, as a carpenter and then bring all of that to the present of a design build project in architecture school, which was really, really fun. You can uh, move to the next one. Uh, so I worked for a few years when I got out of school and, um, but I you know, really was interested in what the West Coast had to offer. Uh, when you kind of dig more into the background of architecture and you learn about kind of the, you know, the history of what uh, different architects from New York brought versus those who came up in Chicago and those the work that was done in Los Angeles in the mid-century. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in those types of projects just within our nation itself. And so the work that came out of Los Angeles, I found to be incredibly inspiring. And so when I made the decision to go back to school and get my master's degree, I packed all my stuff up into, in a U-Haul trailer, which is down there in the bottom left-hand corner, I didn't have much stuff. I only had, you know, one bedroom apartment and I still have a one bedroom apartment uh, and drove all the way across the country to Los Angeles. And I 
uh, went to Woodbury University, which is in Burbank, uh, and got my master's degree from, uh, from there, from their School of Architecture. So these are just a couple of images of my time there and the, my thesis project uh, while I was a student. And I think that is it yeah. for my background. But then, but yeah, so I'll get into some more of the what we do and all that. But that was, the, you know, th that whole journey and that uh, process uh, was incredibly eye-opening to me that, you know, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, like you can find inspiration from very different parts of the world, very different parts of the country and bring them into what we do today. Thanks, Dan. So um, everyone wanted to do a little uh, check here. Um, I haven't, Ruben, I know you're monitoring the chat, but we wanted to pause um, to see if there were any questions or anything that's come up um, that people want to ask us or talk about, about our personal journeys. They haven't popped uh, in anything yet, but so if you're thinking, yeah, go ahead. Is that you, Max? Uh, yeah, I just... Uh... I, so for the two of you specifically, like, a like Danielle, you, you're an outdoors person, like a, you, and a, you use that for like your referencing for what you do. And, uh, uh Christina, the same for you, like, uh, for your backgrounds too, you, your backgrounds are sort of what influences on how you do architecture. But I feel like my main question is, is how do you connect what you do personally, like hobbies, for example, and connect that to what you would do for professionally, architectural wise. Like, how do you make that connection? Really, I mean, I mean, I know I'm not, like it might like take years, maybe like to build up that connection. But I was just wondering, like, uh, for you guys, what was it like for you specifically? Dan, why don't you start? Sure. Well, one of the things that I mentioned was that I love doing life with with people like, and, and, and participating in, you know, whether it just be, uh, you know, hanging out on the beach or going to, you know, grab a beer with somebody and hearing about their life story and uh, doing life with people is the, one of the most like meaningful things to me. And so that involves listening. And so listening to what, uh, what other people's story and where they're coming from or things that matter to them and hearing what matters to them is what inspires me and connects me to the work that I'm doing. So yeah, it's part of like who I am, my hobbies, like the things that interest me, I might draw from that in terms of like some type of inspiration of like, oh, you know, this, this mountain really uh, had some kind of significance that I brought, tried to bring that into a project that I worked on. But most of it comes from our connection to the clients that we work with. And so when, you know, when we start a project, we start by just sitting down and listening to them, hearing what their needs are, hearing what their wants are, what their, what is what makes them tick, what gets them excited to get out of bed every day. And hearing that is the, the way that we draw connection into the work that we produce. And so we're going to share a few projects in a little bit, but, and I have some kind of examples of how we uh, tried to accomplish that. Yeah. And I would just say, Max, thanks for, thanks for the question. And for me with, um, with my hobbies and what I was interested in, I think I just tried to distill it to like, what, what is this really about? Um, and so, you know, my hobbies were honestly, you know, going dancing, traveling, hanging out with friends, you know, and those are the, those are, um, and like going to museums, appreciating art. There were a lot of things that I like to do that I'm like, well, how do I, how do I get paid to go party? Um, you don't, <laughs> but it's like, what are, what are the things that you enjoy that, that translate? And one is the interaction with, with people. I know Dan mentioned listening. Um, but I think in my case, it's also, it's coordinating, it's planning. It's, it's, I, I really love big, big picture thinking and, and ideas and future planning. And those are some of the things that I, I, I bring into my work now where I'm, I'm thinking ahead and I'm trying to, to see problems down the road and figure out how do we fix things today that prevent something that's coming down the road. And who'd have thought that what I was into 20 years ago is, has shaped my brain to be able to, to think this way today. Um, and um, the other thing is also this, 
like I used to help my dad, like whenever we went to Ikea and bought something, like I would help my dad put that together. Not my brother. He's like, no, I'm good. I'm gonna play this video game. But I'm like, oh no, I love putting together the furniture. Or I like to, whenever we moved, I would, I would, my dad and I would hang stuff up, hang all like the picture frames up. Right. So then thinking about the importance of measuring, <laughs> of uh, proportion, of how things work in a space, um, of finding out how things like get put together. Uh, all, all of that helped mold my brain into uh, a design student and an architecture student. So that those are some of the ways that happened. All right. Well, I think, Max, that's actually a great transition into the what, um, which is uh, what we do today um, and our projects. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we're oh, talking by about, the way, that's oh, go ahead. Dan. Uh, if you can oh, yeah. flip back one, that, that's a, <laughs> this is our office space right here. So this is a really cool shot of the, to the left are, is kind of our open studio area. And so that's where Christina and I work every day um, in the front here on the right. When you first walk into our, into our studio space, we have an art gallery um, and it's a place for local artists. Um, in the uh, Southern California area to have an opportunity to kind of show their work on display. And it allows us to connect the work that we do to the arts community in a really tactful way. Uh, and so it's, that's one of the things I love about working at HDA is like every day when I walk through the doors, I'm immediately greeted by something new and inspiring on a regular basis. We, we rotate um, shows uh, every kind of quarter of the year and when we have shows, we have an opening and uh, every, the, the community is welcome. So keep that, you know, follow us on Instagram uh, and you'll hear about when we have gallery openings and you're welcome to come visit and check out the studio space at the same time. Yeah, it's called the Euclid Gallery and it does have its own um, website and Instagram, um, which Ruben, we can share with you. Great. And where your office is is it closer to the Bergamont station of the Expo line or is it the next station? 17th Street. 17th Street, it's right there, huh? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're actually, we're on, um, we're on Euclid, which is technically 13th Street, but yeah, we're 1301 Euclid. So we're, a or 1301 Colorado rather. And so we're just like a few blocks down from the 17th Street. Okay. Great. Well, we'll dive into um, some project stories here. So I'm going to share um, one longer story of uh, a project that I'm working on now. Um, this is a theater renovation for the Educational Cultural Complex. They also call themselves ECC. So if you hear me say ECC, it is uh, this project uh, in this context. Um, and it's run by the San Diego College of Continuing Education. Um, and so this is a, a renovation project. It's an existing building in San Diego that was built in the mid 70s. Uh, needs, needs a lot of love, uh, but uh, an interesting aspect of this project, uh, well, here we go, some interior conditions. Some things to observe is the building has a very kind of heavy masonry material which was you know super hot back in the in the mid 70s but now they really struggle with a building that feels very fortress like and unwelcoming uh in a community where they uh they want people to come seek out education seek out opportunities uh access resources. So they very much are a fixture in the local community, but the architecture no longer serves that purpose. Um, and so, you know, the, the project um, that we got hired to do was uh, they got grant money. They have an existing theater in here and they got grant money to renovate it. But as we dove into the project, we also learned that, okay, well, yeah, there's the theater, but then the entry um, could be a lobby, but the lobby's on the second floor. So if you're in a wheelchair, you actually don't access the lobby or the theater until you go through a corridor and get to the elevator. So, you know, the project wasn't was was funded because it's a theater, but it actually encompasses a larger part of the corner of this building. Um, and so our task was really to kind of reevaluate this main entry to this building. That was honestly never meant to be never meant to be the entry um, to this building at all. 
So something special about this this project um, and is that yes, it's a renovation, but this this project has a strong historical significance in the community. Um, and so really asking uh, the right questions, doing a ton of research, doing a lot of community engagement. We actually have uh, design partners um, that that worked with us, not just during pre-design when we were doing uh, the bulk of our community engagement, but also throughout and developing cultural criteria um, during schematic design. And now we're in design development. So we're still, still early days of the project, but um, this history and the significance in the community was an interesting thing to balance with the needs of the, the community college district and the people who actually own and occupy the building. Um, so uh, building opened in 1976. It was part of the Model C Cities program um, at that time. And uh, it, was, it was a huge deal. This actually became uh, the part of San Diego it's in, East San Diego is a predominantly black community. Um, this building was a place where prominent political figures, uh, national figures in the uh, civil rights movement would come to ECC to speak. And so you can see there's a picture here of Coretta Scott King. I mean, she came in and spoke here. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg performed in this theater uh, way, way back in the day. And this is a period of time from the mid seventies to probably the late eighties that they call the golden age at the ECC. And so this is so much rich history, so much love for this building and this theater and the community. They also have, have a long-term kind of informal partnership with Common Ground Theater, which is um, one of the, the oldest uh, African-American theater groups, theater companies in the country. And they're based, they're based in San Diego. And this is, this is the theater they've performed in the most over the years. Um, so, you know, our jobs was to respect, to know this history, understand the voices to bring into the conversation, ask the questions that weren't being asked, but then also translate that into, into a design project for the future. So we kind of talked about it as there's transitioning the ECC from the golden age to the platinum age. Um, and the project has always been about these three phases, balancing the past, the present, um, and the future. The the college president, Dr. Tina King, I mean, she is she is just a visionary person, super energetic, a lot of passion for the community and for the school. And, um, you know, she really helps drive decision making and move this project forward. And our, our charge is to meet the needs of this community and the school and also make sure that uh, we're preparing them for the next 50 years of this community. So all of that is before we even get to the architecture, right? Like these are the conversations, these are the things that we need to know um, before we can even put pen to paper. Uh, so uh, in, in the beginning, looking when you're dealing with a renovation, right, you're actually, you're working with constraints. And this is a building that structurally, these massive masonry walls, there's not a whole lot we can knock down <laughs> without causing some major structural implications. And it's a building that has a strong geometry. So the drawing, the diagram here on the left is a, you know, it's a, it's a marker sketch on trace over, an ex, over the existing plan, but it is really to understand where these big um, masonry sheer structural walls are, and that's what's noted in red. And most of them are at a diagonal, right? So we had this very strong angular geometry um, that kind of went against, you know, what we were trying to do with the program. And in the beginning of the design, we were kind of fighting this. We're like, okay, how do you soften up? Do you use curves and, and whatnot? But ultimately we started to see this as an opportunity to work with this geometry and convert them from barriers to uh, architectural elements that can actually foster connection. So uh, the geometry really, once we embraced it, allowed us to layer on, on programming and not just the program of, okay, we need X amount of seats in the theater. We need an event space for 20 people. We need to refurbish this classroom. Then the offices need to move over there, but also layer on what 
what are the conceptual desires for this space? It needs to be welcoming. We need places for reflection of this great history that, that they have. We need places to gather because this is a community that comes together in person. Um, so those are kind of the intangibles that we're tasked with uh, making physical realities. And so with that, you know, we worked with our, our design partners, um, just, just Design. Um, so they were our community engagement partners, um, and then they have provided uh, and helped distill the cultural and uh, the cultural and kind of exhibit display criteria for the space. But they really work to develop themes for the project, and we over, uh, such as um, the Golden Age Gallery, which was uh, places to display artifacts and art from the last uh, fifty years. Um, the connection between indoor and outdoor their, posi their um, position in the civil rights movement locally. Um, and then the confluence space is kind of this foyer that currently connects everything together, but is not really the nicest place to be and is a little um, disoriented. So these are the layer, we kind of had this thematic overlay over an existing building, over a program overlay. So lots of things to think about and balance. And as it started to manifest architecturally, the solution to kind of connect all of these spaces on different levels, it really became a project about a ceiling. Um, we called it, initially the concept was um, this sky sleeve that started to connect all these spaces with one architectural move from the ceiling. It also allowed you to connect outdoors to in indoors. And we realized that this was a concept that also worked really great with the geometry. Um, so we moved to section and um, really understanding how this building exists on two different levels. The, the main entry that you, that the current main entry used to be the back of the building and that's on a lower level. Um, and then the old main entry, which is not the back of the building is uh, at an upper level. And so um, that undulating ceiling um, really allowed us to connect the building on different levels and really understand how the outside welcome connected to the inside welcome that then connected to the foyer um, and uh, a cafe that we're proposing and all going through the theater. And so down here, you can see how that, uh, that ceiling starts to manifest into a trellis and a new front porch for the entry or uh, the, the sheer ceiling of the lobby in here, um, a future community room space, and then ultimately the theater and reshaping the inside of that space. Uh, and this was a, you know, there's technical drawings, there's diagrams, but there's also uh, this, this collage that really captures the essence of the client and the cultural component and um, just what's important to them and what is the energy that wants to exist in this space. And so while this doesn't make it into your construction documents, this images like this, uh, which this collage was done by, by our partners, Just Design, images like this really, really drive us and inspire the design from day one. And we're keeping this in mind as we, as we finish finishes and move into construction. Uh, another, you know, interesting part about renovations is you have these parameters, um, but it's also hard to explain, even though folks have been in the building for decades, right? It, not everyone can read plans. So finding different ways to kind of help folks understand, all right, this is a floor plan. What's moving, what's moving where? Wait, I'm not going to be in this space anymore. Where's my new space? So um, we had a lot of different uh, types of drawings and different ways to, to it, just translate like what, what we know and see to someone who doesn't work in this, uh, in this medium every day. Um, and the best part, um, I think about renovations and I've done, I actually, before I came to HGA, most of my work had been renovation work uh, and at HGA, it's been mostly new construction. But what's nice about renovation is the people who occupy the building, they have been there so long. A lot of the times they can't see potential or can't understand how something can look different or it's hard to plan ahead because they're planning for spaces they, they've never had or don't already have today. 
Um, but that can be a challenge in design, but the payoff is huge when the building opens and people walk in and the building that they've been in for the last decade or so is just unrecognizable. So we, we use, you know, we're still early days in design, but we use really easy, you know, renderings either from um, Rhino or we, we use an Enscape plugin for a Revit model um, to get some really nice uh, and just like simple and clean and conceptual, but start to see before and after shots, right? So here's your current, here on the left is right when you walk into the front door, you're kind of greeted by this like big forehead of a balcony. But so then how is that going to change? It's like, oh, well, the we're getting rid of that and opening that whole space up into a two-story volume. And then moving into the theater itself, looking at it today and then looking at here, here's what it could be. Here's how the seating um, can change to have an accessible cross aisle and a first floor entry at the bottom. Here's how you can move the aisles around um, to, to make the seating experience more pleasant and to encourage people to, to spread out more in the theater. And then also um, to make the views more focused, to space the seats out so they're more focused on the stage and more engaged. How do you create a whole new shell on the inside and create a whole new identity of a theater in an existing space? And for a theater specifically, in this case, um, we work in section a lot, like that center line section through, through the space is the best way to describe the functionality of a theater, which is highly technical, but it's our job to break that down into the blocks that need to connect to be able to explain that to folks who are non-theater, because a lot of the times your client, um, not everyone in your stakeholder group on your client side understands how these things need to work together. So ultimately, you know, we're just, uh, we're at we were at the end of schematic design um, when these images were done. We're in design development in the next phase now. So now we're we're diving into the details, but um, just the potential of this this space, the warmth we can bring into these spaces that are really in kind of like this masonry CMU hard shell. Uh, we're really excited to continue to explore that with the client and um, for the end product. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Awesome. That's, well, I, do we, is, are there any questions about what Christina just <laughs> yes, presented? Not a lot. <laughs> so, other, otherwise we'll like, we'll lose it by the time, you know, we get past my stuff. So I just wanted to yeah. give a moment if anyone has any questions or curiosities about what Christina was just talking about. Yes, jump in, folks. I, I have one question on uh, uh, just the uh, acoustics of it. The um, the cladding is these like wood slats, or yeah. And so, what's behind it? Is it is it like some acoustical uh, adding or something that's giving you the reverberation, or is it really the uh, what's what you're striving to achieve is the deadening of sound? So that's a that's a, a great question, and um, the studies we did at the beginning in pre-design to an to answer that question, um, we had to ask what is this theater? What is the primary purpose of this theater? And these were questions um, that we talked about a year and a half ago. But is the theater's primary use going to be theatrical performance? Is it lecture? Is it music? It so this this also led us um, to understand if they need to use more, is it more unamplified music that's happening here or amplified sound that's happening here? And so what we learned is like, if this was, if this was a, a theater that it's like Disney concert hall, where it's like very focused on um, non-amplified sound and they have, you know, chamber choirs and like quartets all the time. Um, it has, it needs to be more acoustically shaped and have a lot more uh, of that treatment on the side. But because this is a theater that is a multi-purpose function, um, mm -hmm. so there is some performance, but it's primarily used for announcements, gatherings in an assembly way. We had to kind of balance uh, both um, amplified and unamplified sound. And so 
to answer your question, Ruben, the wood slats, it's actually acoustically transparent. So there's no, there, there isn't acoustic value in this inner shell. The acoustic value happens, yeah, just beyond with some minor treatments in the ceiling. We're still um, honing that in, uh, but it doesn't need to have a lot of absorption just because of what is happening in the theater. Okay, great. Any other questions? people may have on this space or what Christine has talked about thus far. Okay, Daniel, we'll let you take it into the next one. All right. So I'm going to start with sharing a project that I worked on actually before I came to HGA. Uh, this was for the uh, Lenox School District. It was a series of three buildings that I did uh, with the Lenox Middle School, Felton and Buford Elementary Schools. And this was one of the first projects that I got to work on after I uh, completed my master's degree and after I got my license uh, in, in California. Um, tying back to kind of my upbringings as, a, as an a, a adopted child, you know, I spent some time when I was when I was young before I really remember, but have, you know, really small memory of, a, you know, at, in an orphanage, in foster care and kind of that upbringing inspired what I did for my thesis project, which was um, I designed an orphanage. That was kind of what, that was what my thesis was about. And um, there was a lot more to it in terms of architectural theory that I'm not gonna get into right now. It's a whole different conversation, but that led me to my interest in doing educational projects uh, as an architect, because I wanted to have an influence on the, the, the spaces that kids spend a lot of their time in. Because we, you know, kids spend so many hours of the of their day in classroom spaces, and that that environment shapes who they become, how they learn, how they think, how they study. And so, as as a designer, if I can have some type of influence, or if we can have influence on the way that we shape those spaces, it can change the you know um, the life of of a child as they're learning, as they're developing. Uh, in their in their younger ages. So this was such an exciting project for me to get to be a part of because the Lenox uh, School District is one of the, uh, it's one of the uh, least funded school districts in the Los Angeles area. So they do not have a lot of money to spend on facilities. And because of that, their facilities were very dilapidated. Um, a lot of the classroom buildings that they had previously and still do, um, they, we weren't able to replace all of them, but a lot of their classroom buildings were uh, buildings that were built in the mid-century, in the 50s and 60s, before um, uh, Los Angeles had really fully blossomed as a city. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with Lenox, it's a town that's right next to LAX. So it's directly underneath of the LAX flight path. Uh, and so you can see that in these photos here with the planes flying in, and they are low. And so when you walk around the town of Lenox and those planes fly in right overhead, I don't know if you ever sat at like the in and out that's next to uh, LAX and watched the planes fly in uh, that uh, some people enjoy doing. I've done that before and it's loud. The sound is almost deafening. So if you can imagine trying to teach or trying to learn in an environment where you have planes flying overhead, uh, it makes it almost impossible to have a conversation or hear what anyone's saying. And so the buildings that uh, Lennox had at the time were uh, very rudimentary shell buildings that didn't have a lot of insulation. Um, they had some windows, but they had all been boarded up because of the sound that was in intruding into the classrooms from the airplanes because it made it, it, it impossible for students to learn. And so kids were going to school in these buildings that had no windows and no natural daylight coming into them, all because of the sound of the airplanes flying overhead. So we partnered with them to explore opportunities to redesign their classroom buildings um, that allowed them to have, uh, first of all, fresh new facilities, but most importantly, were able to um, allow natural daylight in while still blocking out the sound of the planes that fly in overhead. We worked with them to partner or to, to research grants that were available. So there's actually a program that you can apply for through LAWA, which is the Los Angeles World Airport. They're the organization that runs LAX. 
and we were able to get grant funding from them in order to help fund the acoustical enhancements of these projects. So these, the, these buildings have like triple insulated glazing, like triple insulated uh, uh, or triple pane glass. The walls are double stud thick walls with extra insulation. And then the shape of the roof that wraps around the top of these and folds over actually serves as an additional acoustical shield in the direction of the noise that the airplanes are producing. And the, what, this project just was a, such an incredible opportunity to be a part of because you saw the transition from students going to class in either portable trailers or in, uh, in buildings that where all of the windows had been boarded up to having the opportunity to go into brand new classroom spaces and learn with uh, beautiful natural light coming in and in an environment where teachers were able to talk and present the, their lessons without being interrupted every 45 seconds by a plane flying overhead. So that's, this is kind of, we're, I'm starting to get into the why I, why I am an architect and why I enjoy doing what I'm doing and what inspires me. And this is a really like perfect starting off point that ties in my interest and like my background and how I can start to shape spaces that change the, the lives of the way that students learn. So we can move on to the next one. So to touch a little bit closer to home, uh, to your own college, uh, I've had the opportunity to work on a project uh, right on your college campus. And I, I don't live that far away either. I live in the South Bay area, just um, you know, jump onto Manhattan Beach Boulevard, drive a few miles uh, towards the beach, and that's the neighborhood that I live in. And so being able to work on projects at Lenox School District, at El Camino College was such an awesome opportunity because I felt like I was able to actually make a change in the community that I, I live very close to. Uh, so HDA, we got this project um, at the bookstore. It's a, it's a really small project, like it's not a big project, but small projects can have still a huge impact. So I don't know how long all of you have been students at El Camino, but um, there used to be this little old nook on the corner of the bookstore called the Manhattan. Uh, and it at one point was like a cafe or, or a grab and go place, but it had been boarded up, closed up, it was dilapidated. And so in the bottom left hand corner is a view of what that looked like after we stripped the outside uh, windows off of the place. And the, the, you know, in a similar dialogue to what Christina was talking about with uh, the theater renovation project where you had this very heavy uh, fortress-like building. The bookstore building, the bookstore cafeteria building at El Camino, is, it's a brutalist, uh, that's the typology for it, it's a brutalist construction. So it's very heavy, it's all made out of concrete, uh, concrete post and beam with concrete double T structures cantilevering out, and it, it's very foreboding uh, kind of when you walk up to it, it, ha it has a very powerful presence. So we kind of thought, okay, how can we reimagine what this, this space could be like? How can we not and, and but still leverage the beauty that is brutalist architecture because it has this very uh, structurally uh, like expressionistic uh, properties that are characteristic of that uh, um, that architectural type where all of these structures exposed and it is really what is the beautiful part of it and so we said how can we and instead of you know completely covering all that up how can we celebrate that to transition the space into a area that students would want to come and faculty would want to come and get a cup of coffee. So this is a small little project on the corner of that building. Uh, and it's now the El Cappuccino Cafe. Uh, and so the, the little before and after photos and one of the, the we really had kind of two, really two major design moves in this entire project because we wanted to simplify what we were doing. And the first being the kind of the L shape of that cafe bar where you'd walk up, order your coffee, order a sandwich or whatever, and, um, and, and experience that, uh, that, that really elegant uh, curve of that L shape that is an accent to all of the hard linear lines of the Google structure. And then the lighting, the lighting was really the second big part where we incorporated these multicolored LED lights that can be changed to any color, any theme of the day that up light uh, into the coffers of that uh, brutalist architecture. 
And instead of it being kind of a foreboding element, it becomes something that's really exciting, uh, sets the mood, sets the tone of the day, uh, and it can be changed for any type of event. Has anyone uh, had the opportunity to, to visit this? I have not visited it. Uh, when I went by, it was closed at that given time, but no one's eaten, eaten there. It's on the call. But I have uh, seen it because when I saw the slide, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you go now, right. you'll think of Dan. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Did I hear a comment? So again, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've gone there many times before, after class and before class. Yeah. I, I was interested in who did it because I was wondering, like, who was behind it. And now that you're explaining it, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, to see that. Awesome. Vicente, I'm super glad to hear uh, that you've been there a bunch of times and that you keep coming back. I guess the coffee must be good as well. Oh, yeah. There's, there's always a bunch of people in there. There's always a line. <laughs> <laughs> that that makes my heart sing. Like, that is why, you know, that, like th these stories are about shaping spaces that change the everyday life of students and that we, you know, just the small thing like a coffee shop can change the, the day of, uh, of anyone as they're studying, as they're learning, as they're headed to class. Mm -hmm. so that's why, that, that's why I'm talking about these. Um, well, the excellent. last one that You're, I wanted to, uh, I, I, oh, will, okay. I will make sure, Daniel, we pick a day to invite you there and take you out for something to, to eat <laughs> there and, and have a meeting there with the, with the, with the gang here. You could tell us about it in person. That would be great. I would be happy to do that. Awesome. All right. So for the next project, I think, Dan, you're going to share your screen, right? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to put this one in the presentation, so I'm just going to share. So bear with me a second. All right. Can you all see that? All right. Yes. All right, great. So this is another uh, community college project. And what I've found to be really enjoyable about working with, with on community college projects is that it's such a pivotal moment in uh, young adults' life. Like I think about the time that I was going to community college and it was a point in my life where I was still trying to figure out who I was, what I'm doing, what do I want to major in, what do I want to do with my life. And the time at community college is just so impactful and so that really uh, gives us the opportunity to create spaces that have an e even bigger impact than those that sometimes happen at four-year universities. So this is um, a project at Los Angeles Southwest College. And so this isn't that far away from El Camino College either. This is also a, a, a community college. Um, and this is a kind of a sneak preview of what I'm going to be sharing. And then we're going to kind of Quentin Tarantino went where we're going to go back to the beginning and uh, rewind all the way to the beginning uh, to show how do we get to this spot right here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the crew on this project or like the team and that while I'm sharing this or Christina's sharing her project, it, like these are not things that we do all by ourselves. It takes a village uh, to actually create the work that we do and to bring it to life. And so this is just a small kind of chunk of the individuals that are part of this project, not only from the designer, from the architects and the project managers and the interior designers, but also the builders and the contractors who are working to, to build it and, and bring it to life. So this is a project at HGA. We are partnered with a general contractor, W O'Neill Construction, uh, and they're the ones that are actually building the project. But even uh, this is still just a kind of a, a small picture of the greater team that has worked on this project to, to bring it to life. So, you know, there's no, none of the work that we're sharing are something that has just been us doing it all by ourselves and we're the sole author. It, it takes a village to actually uh, create. So this project, I wanted to share the, the, the legacy of why this project is meaningful and why we're bringing it to life. This is a lady by the name of Odessa B. Cox. And so she was a community member um, around Los Angeles Southwest College. Southwest College is situated 
kind of nest in the neighborhood of West Athens, which is kind of uh, between uh, Gardena and Hawthorne and Watts to the south and Compton. Uh, so it's kind of nestled between all of those neighborhoods. And she had the vision that she wanted to bring education to the community of West Athens. Uh, at the time, this was in the kind of the late 1940s, uh, 1950 era. And at the time, there was no college in the area that uh, um, the young adults could go to to get an, an education in that community. Uh, they had to go to downtown Los Angeles. And the distance to get to downtown, the actual geographical uh, uh, issues of traveling or transportation were a barrier for uh, young people to be able to uh, go to college education. And a lot of, uh, so she was seeking to bring education to this community and that was her mission. And so she fought for it. It was the thing that mattered to her most. Um, what really uh, kicked off the uh, funding for, to bring Los Angeles Southwest College to, to life was um, after the Watts riots, there was kind of a uh, pivotal moment where the Los Angeles Board of Education uh, looked for opportunities to kind of respond to the voices that were uh, trying to be heard during the Watts riots and see what kind of changes they could make to actually respond in a positive way to that. And so Odessa uh, is, was kind of famous for saying that without the Watts, without the Watts riots, there would be no Los Angeles Southwest College. And the two are very interconnected in terms of their history. And so her vision was always looking to the future. What could the next generation, what could she build for the next generation? And so while she brought this entire college and this organization, we're just kind of playing a small part in that, that we're thinking about the future of the students uh, and the uh, facilities that we can bring to help them. Los Angeles Southwest College, uh, similar to, has a very similar kind of um, student body to El Camino College, where there's a, a predominant, the majority of students that go here are either of black or brown descent. And uh, there's a large majority of them are also first generation college students. So it's very intimidating, you know, coming to college for the first time when your family does not have that type of background. And so we wanted to be cognizant of that and sensitive to that in the spaces that we designed. Also thinking about kind of the, uh, one of the elements that was very important to the college was student success and creating spaces that helped foster student success. That after only taking a few classes and kind of getting frustrated or not feeling like you have a place or a, a somewhere where you belong, students would be dropping out. And so we wanted to create a facility that was welcoming, that helped create a sense of home, a sense of place where students felt like they had an impact and they belonged so that it helped graduation rates and overall student success on their way to uh, their four-year universities or their career of choice. And so the student union uh, is what became the, the, the project that we are, we are working on with them. And I'm going to skip over a few slides because I we're kind of getting a little bit short on time, but I wanted to give a little bit of context here. So this is the campus of LA Southwest College. And when we work with the college for trying to figure out the site of where this project should go, we wanted the student union to really be in the heart of the campus. And so there was this existing parking lot that was underutilized and wasn't uh, really kind of a thriving environment, as you would say. Uh, but it was an opportunity for us to create a new heart of the campus uh, that students would want to come to. This is the kind of views of what used to be uh, on, in this parking lot, just a big old piece of asphalt that the only thing that would come there was a food truck. And so students would come there and get food. And this food truck was the only way that uh, students could get food on campus. Uh, currently, there's no food service element, there's no cafeteria, there's no restaurants uh, on campus. And that became a really big driving factor that working with the college, we wanted to bring opportunities to get food on campus because we were dealing, uh, we're working with students that many of which have food insecurities. And we wanted to uh, kind of take that off the table that when you're coming to college, when you're coming to class, figuring out where you're gonna get a bite to eat 
it's suddenly no longer an issue because we've got it right here at the student union. So food, a place of belonging, a place of study, those are all kind of driving factors to what we were trying to bring on this project. Christina talked a little bit earlier about constraints. And so we had some constraints on this project, but while they, it's not working in an existing building, you know, we've got this, uh, let's call it an like a blank slate of this parking lot that's kind of a canvas for us to work on but what's not obvious is what's underneath of that parking lot and so it's something that you might not think about uh, without digging up the ground but there were a lot of constraints that existed underneath the parking lot so while it's a blank canvas the constraints were real so this is a diagram of that parking lot and Working uh, as we got into it and we had a utility survey and some uh, geological surveys, what we found out was that these two blue zones right here were existing fault lines on the project, right? We live in California, uh, earthquake, earthquakes are a real thing, a San Andreas fault, that's a real thing. And it came to life for us when we discovered that there were seismic fault zones that borderlined our project. And so, uh, According to the California code, we are not allowed to build within 50 feet of those fault lines. So we had to create a setback zone 50 feet either side that we couldn't build within. Underneath the parking lot, we also found that there's some existing underground utilities, uh, different uh, water and, and fire water and chilled water, all of different these services that serve different buildings on the campus already that we didn't want to disturb. So that's highlighted there in the pink dash line. And then to the south, uh, there was a fire lane. And so we had to maintain that fire lane that allows for the passage of fire trucks, emergency vehicles in the event of a fire. You know, I'm sure you've all seen uh, roadways that have the, the red curbs that you're not allowed to park on. Uh, and so just like that, we couldn't build in that area because that that part of the project had to remain open for uh, fire traffic to be able to get through. So that set up these kind of weird constraints of a weird geometry that we had to work within. And so we started taking the pieces of the building blocks of the program that we were trying to fit in this project and say, okay, well, okay, how do we squeeze this into here and uh, started playing around with it. Uh, but we also wanted, you know, this is, this was a project for community college. And so because of that, the, we were working with a very uh, constrained budget. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on this project. And so we, because of that, we had to make it um, rational. It had to make sense. It had to be easy to be built. It, it, we weren't able to do a lot of, let's like kind of crazy architectural gymnastics curves or angles or things that um, sometimes add cost to the project. So we looked for opportunities to, okay, how do we work within the constraints that we have also rationalize it, put things on a normalized structural grid that work well with conventional structural systems. And we figured out that, okay, well, we couldn't fit everything that we needed to within the constraints that we had. Um, so if we build up, that created an opportunity for us where now suddenly we could, we can't build on top of those fault lines, but we could actually cantilever over them on the second floor. And so on the second floor, we were actually able to grow our square footage by cantilevering out over top of those fault zones uh, that you would not otherwise have any idea why we cantilevered on. Uh, this is just a snapshot of all of the pieces of the program, what we call the program. Those are the spaces. Those are di the different elements that go into a building. And this is a conglomeration of all of those pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to fit together uh, into that into that envelope. And so um, we looked at a lot of different kind of influences on the site. We looked at the way that vehicles and pedestrians are coming in and, and moving around the site. We looked at the way that the sun uh, was tracking around the site and the kind of prevailing wind direction to help us make design decisions about how we would orient the project, where we would put uh, windows, where we would put overhangs. And we looked at opportunities for green space and open plaza areas that we could connect to or, or build upon uh, with our project. And so the kind of the resulting diagram uh, is what you see here, where it, we, we're looking at a variety of site influences, whether it be fault lines, seismic fault lines, 
or whether it be uh, fire lanes or the direction that people are coming from different facilities on the project to help shape the way that we laid out the spaces and laid out the geometry of this project. And these are just a couple of uh, axon diagrams that start to talk about the way that we're connecting into the, the fabric of the campus. And this is our kind of our rendered site plan that shows our connection to the, uh, the plaza that we're building out and outdoor zones that uh, allow people to hang out not only inside, but also outside. Um, and these are a few of the, the I just wanna share the floor plans to get you an idea of kind of what we, the, the results of all of that are these floor plans that we produce uh, that then get refined to another level of construction documents. So what, what I do on a daily basis is I work with our clients, I work with our team of engineers to help design solutions that we, we take a concept design and then we actually figure out how to bring it to life. And so that involves creating a very detailed set of drawings that allow a contractor to then take those and bring them to, to actually build them. And so that polishing of that, that refinement, that polishing of, a, of an idea into a buildable set of drawings is really what I spend a lot of my time doing where I'm getting into the actual nuts and bolts of building systems and architectural systems and coordinating all of those efforts with um, different engineers and with different trades to actually figure out how to construct the building uh, once, it's, once we're out in, the, uh, out in the field. So that's how we got to kind of where we are here. Um, the goal for this project was to be as economical as possible on the building envelope. So we're using some fairly economical materials of like a corrugated metal panel and some very simple glazing, but that we would then invest the money for the budget for this project into the areas that matter most for the students. So the areas where students come in, where they hang out, where they're studying, where they're spending time, the surfaces and materials that are they're actually sitting on, touching, experiencing, walking around, that's where all of the kind of the, the efforts and the primary amount of funding for the project would be spent. And so this is a view into kind of the lobby space when you first walk into the building and you're greeted with this really beautiful sculptural stair that has this seating element on it. And so we, ha we wanted to work with this kind of combination of natural raw materials of, of concrete and exposed concrete and natural wood, but then the offset by these very elegant kind of just very clean uh, glass railings and, and white walls and white ceilings. And these are a before few you, images. Be, some, before you oh, ran too far, can you go yeah. back? You, you, the slide before the slide you spoke on was pretty interesting looking. Go back one. Yeah, oh, this one. This one? No, no, that one. Yes. Oh, yeah. So um, this is, uh, these are some detailed drawings that show the stair um, that's in this rendering. So if you look at this stair that kind of comes up and wraps around and goes up to the second floor, these are some of the construction drawings uh, for that stair. So we can see a 3D image here on the left. And then these are kind of our really detailed plans that start to outline all of the dimensions, all of the spatial requirements that are needed for that stair. Um, there's also a bunch of section cuts that I didn't put in this presentation, but uh, stairs are really difficult to design, not only from a structural standpoint, but also they have a lot of code requirements because they're tied to the ability for somebody to get safely out of a building, for them to egress, exit out of the building. So there's code requirements for how much width you have to incorporate in a stair. And then also, how do you make a stair accessible for somebody? And all of the requirements of having a handrail that's easy to be grasped um, for somebody that might be going up and down the stair with a disability or, or exiting out of the building. And uh, the code requirements for stair are very, very complicated sometimes. And so there's a lot of iterative study that it takes to get a stair to the point where it's ready to be built. Yeah, very cool. Very cool drawings and design there. There was one question that was in the chat, and I think it may have been uh, thoroughly answered in the development of this project, but it's it stated, Dan, how do you start your projects? Do you already have a plan what you are designing when you are visiting the location? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I guess, you know, I'll kind of go back to 
the image here. And the, the answer really is, is no. Um, and it's kind of from our perspective, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier on, but one of the things that we kind of feel like defines who we are as HGA is that um, you wouldn't look at HGA projects and say, oh, there's a specific style that they have uh, that you might alight, you know, if you look at something that's by Frank Gehry or Tom Main or uh, Rem Kuhlhoff or, or, you know, some of the really famous, you know, Bjarke Ingels, they, they all have kind of a, a very identifiable style that you might be able to put your finger on and say is, is one of their projects. And at HGA, we don't necessarily have a specific style because we believe that the most important thing that we bring to the work that we do is listening to our clients, listening to the people that we're working with. For this project, we started the we, we didn't put any pen to paper until we sat down with what we call the building user group. And we shortened that to the bug group. Um, and the building user group was anyone that's ever going to come into this building and actually use it. So that was a group of people from the faculty members on the college to the administration and leadership of the college, the facilities people that uh, run the college, and most, most importantly, the student body. So we had a group of about six or seven different students that were part of our building user group that we met with on a weekly basis and to hear the things that were important to them. I kind of, I maybe skipped over that and I could have talked about that earlier on, but when I talked about that, the idea of listening, this was so, some of the things that we heard from students that they wanted a place that was, you know, a place of engagement that they had easy to, it was easy to access, that it had, good food, good vibes, that you could build relationships, that, it, you know, community, uh, like, and then the, from the uh, administration of the, of the building or of the college, they were looking to, you know, kind of really help with student retainment and success. They had a building that was safe and accessible. So that idea of listening was so key. So it's not, you know, we don't really come to a project or come to a site and already have an idea of what it's going to be until we sit down and listen. And then once we hear these things, once we uh, understand and start to unwrap them, the hard part is then synthesizing those. Like how do you take these words, how do you take those uh, concepts and synthesize that into something that is architecture? And that's something that like as designers, that's what we, that's what we learn how to do in design school is you're taking ideas, you're taking th uh, concepts or theory that you might read about from, uh, from a certain assignment and trying to kind of develop that into an idea. And it's not easy, right? It's like, it comes with just repetition and practice over and over and over again. And every one of our projects builds on the last that, you know, this isn't a perfect example of responding to all of uh, the building users desires and wants and needs, but it, it does a pretty good job uh, we think, and you know, it's a building block and a stepping stone for for the next one. So, I don't know if that answered, but a short answer is no. We don't come to a site with kind of preconceived ideas. It's all about listening and responding to those. I think it is, and definitely everybody with your voice, as uh, Dan and Christina have stated, uh, you can use your voice and jump in. Yeah, I think actually this is a good point. I mean, we're at, we're we're near the end. So, um Dan, I think if yep. if you want to stop sharing here. Yep. Um oh, or maybe just like share a construction photo. There we go. Oh, where yeah. is this project That's today? <laughs> yeah, this so this was taken a few weeks ago, maybe more month or so ago, but it's kind of, you know, bringing it's it's what, what I wanted to end by just talking about like Designing and, and being an architect still hasn't lost its magic to me. The fact that we get to draw lines on paper and then some, they, they become actual real structures that then you can go and inhabit. Like I, I was here on this project today and I walked through here and it all started with us drawing lines on paper and our team kind of developing ideas. And that to me is magical. That's um, the impact yeah. that this makes for students and what, it, what, what that results in is, is the magic of why we do what we do. Thanks, Dan. And so, you know, that kind of 
concludes our our what and why uh, portion. The thing I would also add is, you know, one of my whys for architecture, um, you know, architecture school gave me a good foundation into this work, but it wasn't until I started working in the, in the practice that I found my true calling um, and really understand what my greatest and best use was uh, in terms of roles. So I was lucky enough to work for firms that really valued different roles in architecture, not just a designer, not just a project architect, but also a, a project manager, interior designer. You just, there's so many ways to go. Um, and my greatest and best use was in, was and is in front of people. Um, in front of people and just kind of being a big picture thinker. And ultimately I see my biggest role is to empower my teams and set the stage for them to do their best work. And so I get, my job is to move all the other stuff out of the way, budgeting, scheduling, um, um, the stuff that people don't wanna do just so that the talented people I work with can shine. So on that note, Ruben, I think we're done. <laughs> Um, and we'd love to hear from, from other folks. Any questions um, would be awesome. Yeah. Any questions people have? I will start off with, with one um, at, and piggybacks on what you were saying there. As a project manager, um, kind of get into the weeds just a bit to give people insight as to what you would do in a, on a given project with some specifics. Yeah. So um, for me specifically, it's uh, it's really the person that 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 leads getting the project done. Um, so once the project is in the door, you know, my job is to set it up for success. So I set up the framework of the project in terms of how we're going to do the work. So um, uh, creating a schedule making sure we're on track for budget. Um, also work plan is the thing that we can never do soon enough, but understanding how the pieces of the team, the PA, the job captain, um, our design coordinators, uh, our, our other specialists in house, how all of those pieces need to work together and when to make sure that we hit our major milestones and get get things in front of the client to get decisions made. So my job is really to, to set that framework. And then um, if we can keep to that, then usually the project, you know, uh, can, can hit its deadlines. And also just, it shows that we're listening to the client and we're not just, you know, working in a vacuum to come back and present something that they're like, well, that's not what we wanted. Right. So it's just make, making sure that we avoid those pitfalls. Um, I do, you know, I, I work a lot with, with staffing um, my projects and just making sure that the right people are on the right teams. Um, and then I'm also very like front facing in terms of I, a lot of the times in the day to day contact with the client. And so if there are questions or if information needs to be gathered, a lot of the time that that funnels through me and then I'm able to, to distribute it um, to the rest of the team on my end. Excellent. Yeah. Has some other questions out there, folks? Uh, I just wanted to uh, double check. Um, so um, for that project, uh, for the one you were, the last project you were talking about, Daniel, um, for make for the outside of it, I did like how it was shaped out just to be a, like a bit of an open area. And for the, also, yeah, for the stairway too, I like that how you had like the stairway going one way and then a little seating area and then the little walkway above it i mean normally i would just see like a general like a shape like going up and going one way but the way you shaped it made it look like a more than one direction really i like that little detail like right above the seating area and uh were those like little like a uh, pillows on the seating because i noticed that like little cushion I don't know if that yeah. was a part of it or was that like it just something? Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to be quick on that, but I, you know, I talked, I talked at the beginning about how the, the geometry of the building was shaped by what is underneath the ground, like those fault lines, the constraints that we're working in. Um, and so you would look at kind of the way that it's shaped 
if not if you don't know about it and kind of wonder like uh, that's interesting but i don't know why uh, and but there is a reason why you know it's not just because we felt like it there's a really factual reason as to why the building is shaped the way that it is and then we allowed that to influence the way that the stair uh, was shaped as well, that the stair itself responds to the actual geometry of the outside of the building, that it's doing a similar thing with the way that it kind of bends over and cantilevers out to create more space on it um, to, um, in, in a way that responds to the rest of the building. But, but yeah, the, the, the pillows, the cushions, the wood, all of those things are really kind of tangible elements that change the way that a space feels. And if you walk in and there's like, a metal or a concrete bench that we wanted to create a place that felt like kind of like home, kind of like a, a, a living room or a dining room that you would come into and you would feel comfortable sitting down and making yourself a spot to study, uh, grabbing a coffee and sitting down there and, and popping open a, a, you know, your laptop and, and getting ready for, for your next class. So that was, you know, the, the materials chosen were meant to be where you would sit and touch and actually interact with were chosen to be really warm and inviting and soft. And we have another, a, a funny question here from Sumit. <laughs> How much sleep do you guys usually get? <laughs> I mean, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so I'm I, <laughs> not a lot, but that's not because of my job. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, you know, architecture is hard. Um, it's, we, we didn't get into this profession because it's easy. Uh, we got into it because we, we, we want to try to make a difference in the world. And there are some really hard times and we, we do push really hard from time to time with project deadlines. Uh, but one of the things that I appreciate about, uh, HGA and in particular, like what Christina was talking about with the way that she manages her projects is that she tries to set them up for success. And that success means that People are not getting overextended on their work-life balance. They're not um, getting burnt out on their on their projects. And you know, we see that sometimes where somebody's having to put in too much effort, and we do whatever we need to to adjust staffing. Christina is really great at that at adjusting staffing and the hours that people are spending on projects to make sure that one person isn't getting too burned out on something. Um, now that. That culture is what we have at our firm. And it's not, you know, obviously architecture has a reputation for people not sleeping for a reason and that that culture isn't the case for all. So I'm not speaking for every firm that you could work for, but that um, that's thankfully the environment that we're part of. And I would say, of course, you know, that that is a good thing, folks, that once you get out of school, as Daniel hinted on and just showed you, projects never get done by singular people they get done by teams so yeah. the burden is much further spread out than when you're in studio and it's your project and the other thing that christina definitely hinted at is the fact that it it is planned out so a project deadline doesn't just magically happen there are half a dozen if not more micro deadlines along the way that are unwavering to make sure that final deadline you're not panicking because you hit yeah. the other deadlines and you start panicking much earlier on much smaller facets of the project and you stick to your guns on that which is not something they teach us in school to do as well right got any other questions we did get um, a last one here or a, a new one here. What is the piece of advice you can give us as students pursuing architecture? Um, I, I think for me, um, mine to, to any student is, is travel. Um, and the reason why I say that is because there are so many resources at um, colleges and other institutions that fund um, that aspect of, of your education, whether through grants or through scholarships or, um, you know, the architecture school can help. And all you have to do is ask, right? You seek it out and ask, but um, it's such a, a short time. It's such a short time in your life. And that's, that's the point to really take advantage of it because the more, the more you see, um, 
the more resources you have to draw from when you're in the profession. And then that's when deadlines and paychecks and, and um, other, other things start to start. I don't want to say get in the way, but right. Like life doesn't, life doesn't get um, easier. Um, it just gets, it gets more, more rich and like more full. So uh, yeah, if you can, if you could take advantage of, of, and you know, I don't know everybody's situation, obviously, but if you could just take advantage of this, this really special time as a student and just absorb as much as you can. That's what I would say. Uh, my piece of advice would be that there's not one linear path to becoming an architect or, or pursuing architecture and that there's a lot of different ways to get there and different journeys. And hopefully we kind of shared a couple of different perspectives today on, on how that was. Um, you know, the kind of the prescribed way that if you looked at it was like, okay, I go to school to be, uh, for architecture, I get an internship at an architecture firm, I, you know, do, do this, this, and this, and this, and in this order, and they're all focused on architecture. And um, when I was going to school, uh, when I was in college, I couldn't find a job with an architect. Um, the economy was in a really different place at the time, and I couldn't get a job with an architect. No one was hiring. And uh, so I worked as a carpenter, like I shared earlier. And that, to me at the time, I felt like I was kind of taking a step back and like, oh, I was, I'm not doing an internship. I'm kind of failing. But now the further in my career, I leverage that experience uh, every day. And the fact that I can kind of think the way that builders think and think the way that contractors think and talk to them in a way that they understand and relate um, architecture uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, you know, a builder thinks uh, is just an incredibly valuable thing. And so there's not one linear path. Like mine took me through carpentry and then actually I worked for an engineering office for a while because I still couldn't find a job with an architecture firm. And um, I worked for the federal government for a while, re renovating some of their projects and, um, and that it all brought me to where I am today. So don't ever worry that like the journey that you're on isn't leading you to that eventual goal. Try to pick up pieces from each experience that helps you become a better thinker, become a, uh, you know, more inquisitive, become just, uh, you know, on your, on your journey. Yeah, excuse me. Like some, those, all those pieces build up to be part of your journey. And if there aren't any questions, uh, other questions, Daniel, we would love to see a few of those photos from the, the last little snippet you were showing the project under construction. If you want to just run through them a little bit, it was pretty. Well, pretty yeah, I, I was worried that we were, we were, uh, running out of time. Um, I, I think we I, are, I mean, we have we, three we, minutes we, left. So yeah, we, we are. We'll you, can through just, them. you can just okay. rifle right. quickly. Sure. Are there absolutely. any other so questions the, while, while he's going through that? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, yes. It's for Christina. Um, for the study of broad programs, um, how would I get into something like that? Or how would I get in contact with people, you know, that would offer study abroad? Yeah, so uh, it's where I found those opportunities were through through my campus. Um, okay. And so, yeah, it's through through the college itself. And sometimes there are partnerships with the Department of Architecture or the College College of Design, you know, how, however it's structured. But then also the institutions may have partnerships with other universities, either in other parts of this country or, or outside um, that would, you could, you know, travel and just study somewhere else and still get the necessary credits. Um, so it's just, and, and that's something that might be able to happen through, um, I'd still go through the college because that, that's just how it worked in my experience. Um, but, you know, that might be something that um, the registrar may have some more information on. But, um, um, Ruben, I don't know what, yeah, what can resources I, can are available. Add, but, yeah, if you could, um, if you could speak Dan to your... Dan might be able to speak to that a little bit. Yeah. We we once had that. But what Christine is alluding to, it, it, it won't necessarily be in our architecture department, but there are often study abroad programs in other genres 
that you could take it take advantage of. It might be um, um, education on you know multilingual uh, programs, and they're studying abroad and going to Italy. So you could do it there. Another point I would add on that is you were, you're going you're gonna to find more study abroad programs um, in the universities. So when you are considering going, continuing on in the School of Architecture at a university, pay attention to the study abroad programs they have because different schools have it in different places and regions. I remember when I was considering architecture schools, Notre Dame came to my high school. I, I was not thinking about going there and I found out that all third year students spent it in Italy. And I'm like, what? <laughs> all third year architecture students, I should say. So I applied there just because of that. <laughs> but you know, you, you need to look at the different universities that you're considering and see where are their study abroad programs. And that might be a, a big reason you choose that school as opposed to um, another. So this is a okay. this is an old this is an old flyer. It, it, it already happened this year. I think they offer it every every summer. Um, but this year, El Camino did offer a, a course that you could take. You could go to Madrid, um, travel there, um, and they have a couple of contacts here. And I believe these are the individuals that run their study abroad program. Um, so you can reach out to them. Um, I'm going to put this link in the chat to the study abroad uh, program from El Camino. But this is specifically with El Camino, not, you know, necessarily uh, colleges uh, that you might transfer to. Okay, thank you. As we're winding down, any other questions, folks? You have the ear of some great architects here. So speak up really quick. And while we're listening, I'll just share these photos that people wanted to see. So this, these are some z uh, z drone photos from the site of the projects that I was sharing. So this is when it was just a parking lot. Um, then we started excavating for all of the foundations. Uh, and we start, you can start seeing these little boxes, which are the, the footings that the structure actually sits on. And this black spot in the middle is a uh, that's where the elevator pit will eventually go and the waterproofing that goes underneath of that. And then here it was actually shortly after it rained and all of the, the excavations for the footings had gotten filled up with water. And this is when the structure, the metal structure and the metal deck, which uh, makes up the roof uh, was completed. And here you can see it from an angle. There's no finishes or no floors actually in this at the time. It's just purely the bones of the project, just the steel and the concrete and the metal deck that make up the primary structure of it. And you can see SoFi Stadium in the background, which I really like. Uh, and then I shared this one a few moments ago. All right. Well, can't thank you enough for the great presentation and insight to your careers and what shaped them and the work you're doing and tickled that a project is on our campus. Like I said, I will have you come one day and talk more about that and uh, break bread, eat there. So that'll that'll be pretty cool. I'll talk to you offline. Um, I'll get from Christine, if I don't have it already, your number, and we'll, we'll set a time to come on through. All yeah, right? please, I'll, I'll please reach out. We would love to connect. Yep. Well, I think that is it, everyone. Thank them for their time. And, you know, we will. Oh, you know what you can put in the chat if you have it uh, accessible. If not, you can always uh, email it to me is the um, Instagram page for the uh, for your gallery in the office. Because we'll certainly try and make a trip there when you have an, an opening yeah future. we'll do i'll probably actually oh hang on <laughs> i'll probably just email it to you but yeah that's confirm. fine um it is just it's here we go here's how do i instagram i mean you can there be dropping in that's the, the handle yep 
Okay, Juliana said, thank you so much for taking your time to give us a wonderful presentation and advice. All appreciate it once again. Great. There we go. And there's the handle. I got it. I'm snagging it. We'll make <laughs> a trip. I try and get them not only to study, study abroad, but just say, you know, uh, there's some other cities just down the street. <laughs> like the Republic of Santa Monica and all of this, just come on <laughs> over. <laughs> you didn't think I knew Very, that, sim huh? very yeah. similar climate to South Bay, I have to say. Yep, and it, there's places they haven't gone. I did a poll and, and almost no one had gone to Third Street Promenade ever and just different things. So I try and get yeah. them out. So maybe we'll make a field trip one day as one of the things we do and visit their office and some of the cool things over there. You're welcome to. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. And bye. Uh, Thank you. Take care. You Thank right. you. Have a great night. Right. Have a good night. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye bye.